what else can I tell you? Oh, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, so as Ben said, we have Rebecca Wetter, who's the school psychologist at O'Malley Innovation Middle School here in Gloucester. She's been at O'Malley for 20 years. Um, she received her certificate of advanced study from Tufts and recently she's uh, her focus has been on incorporating mindfulness and trauma informed teaching practices in the classroom. She's also a mom of two teens. We also hi Rebecca. Thanks for being here. She might be muted. <laughs> um, hi everyone. <laughs> there she is. Thanks. Um, and I want to also introduce Dan Graham. Dan is a clinical social worker who specializes in child and adolescent mental health. He's worked in after school programs for at risk youth. Um, he's worked in teen centers, therapeutic mentoring, facilitating LGBTQ support groups, and providing outpatient therapy. Um, Dan lives in Gloucester uh, with his wife and daughter, Kaya. So, Dan, welcome. Thank you for being here, too. Hi, everybody. We are really lucky to have you both. So if anyone, uh, I don't see any hands raised just yet. Oh, I also, before we go to questions, um, I wanted to just draw your attention to the chat. Larissa um, is posting a lot of resources and information that um, we've pulled together, thanks to Dan and Rebecca. Um, and uh, we wanted to share that out with you. We also have Dr. Brian Orr on our call tonight, and he's shared some information with us as well. So thanks for that, Brian. Um, so to kick us off, um, we also got some great questions from you guys when you registered for the event. So I'll be bringing those into the conversation tonight as well. Um, but I, I think one thing that um, is uh, really weighing heavy, heavily on all of our minds is that, you know, like safety versus socializing question. Um, I think, you know, something that I know I'm struggling with with the teenagers, like the isolation that is required to keep your kid away from COVID risk can, you know, sometimes feels like you're forcing them into another risky situation by keeping them so isolated. Um, and which is worse? How do we make the right call? How do we be safe and keep our kids mentally healthy? It's a big question, um, but I think it's, it's on a lot of our minds. So Rebecca, do you want to start us off with some thoughts? Sure. On and we'll go to Dan. I, I think, you know, you really got to the meat of what the big concern is with parenting teens in general. We're always concerned about um, their risk when they go out and do things independently. And now we're dealing with, you know, a real illness that could potentially be dangerous. And we've been... Um, told repeatedly that we need to be isolating in order to be as safe as possible. Um, being a mental health professional, I feel like, you know, of course my slant is always making sure our kids' mental well-being is really, really right there along with their physical safety. And I think the kids that, and the families that have been able to be most successful navigating this risk versus um, being safe in this pandemic is they've been able to keep an ongoing conversation about negotiating when and how they see their friends. So for instance, I have um, a great group of eighth grade girls that, um, you know, I was told, listen, I was very adamant with my, with my mom that I needed to see my friends, that I was not feeling happy. This was really impacting me. And I think that's the general sense with all of our kids. And what they did is they, they really picked and chose different activities that these girls could, could do outside or in a way where they were masked um, and in a safer way, reduced risk way that they could see each other on a regular basis. Because I do feel like the main thing that is really, um, you know, interfering with our kids' mental health right now is that level of isolation. So that negotiation with parents about how and when to socialize and how to do it safely is, is imperative. These students have also um, developed um, or they, they consistently have FaceTime sleepovers. So whereas, you know, they would be sleeping over and spending like all sorts of, you know, great hours together, you know, watching movies, they're doing that all virtually. But I think that is just, you know, one small thing. I think what we need to do is get our kids back together and seeing their friends 
in person and figuring out a way to do it. Masked, outdoors, um, taking walks, going on picnics, playing pickup basketball games. It's, it's, it's important and, and a must for their mental health. Thanks, Rebecca. Dan, do you want to build on that or add anything? Um, it, it, this is the problem with working with Becky Wetter. Is she's brilliant. <laughs> she's said everything that needs to be said. But no, I think, um, you know, I, I, I went to the talk last week. And, and when you look at like elementary school kids, there's still that sort of uh, parent-child dynamic that plays out. But I think the big piece for us who work with middle school to high school kids is to really be cognizant of what's going on developmentally, right? So the function and, and you know, Ben, I love you, but just accept this now. A middle schooler's job is not academics. A middle schooler's job is not scoring MCAS. A middle schooler's job is to learn to socialize and develop their identity and, and explore that identity in relationship to other people. And, and their function is to be social. That's what they do, right? And so the challenge for us right now is that um, that's the area that we're hitting them in, is, is we're taking away their ability to socialize and we're sort of highlighting either physical safety, right? Don't expose yourself to the risk of this illness or um, academics or everything. So you turn on the computer, you do academics and then you shut it off and then you're in family time. All that's antithetical to what kids should be doing in this age group is they should be socializing with their peers. So, you know, I'll always give the caveats of, you know, with masks, hand sanitizing, social distancing, but we should be doing everything in our power right now to foster opportunities for them to socialize. Some of that may be through social media and, and kind of lightening up on some of the restrictions we put on kids. Um, definitely meeting in the park is okay. Um, you know, I think the world of Dr. War and I'm glad he's here and I think he's more, <laughs> you know, he, he, his expertise is better than mine to talk about the safety factor. But one of the things I've taken away from him is that, you know, being outdoors, uh, following the, the COVID protocols, your kids can hang out, they can talk, they can be together. And that socialization does more for their immune system and their mental health than a healthy diet, right? So eating vegetables and fruits, awesome, great, do it. But it's more important for your middle schoolers and your high schoolers to be interacting with their peers. It's their function. And uh, we, we need to mitigate our own anxiety and our own distress as adults with this once in a hundred year pandemic, which we've never experienced. We need to work with our own feelings to create a space where the kids can be kids because it's their job. Um, so let them play. I guess that's that's my takeaway, you know, put on a mask, wash your hands and go play, go meet at Burnham's Field, go hang out, you know, go sit on the rock downtown, meet me at the anchor and let's hang out because um, that's what they need to be doing. That's their job. And I want to add, Dan, I mean, we've had a lot of conversations about with our students about how creative they've been about crafting opportunities to have that socialization. So we have kids that have never skateboarded before that went out and bought skateboards because they could do that with a peer in a socially distanced way. I already talked about, you know, kids have been going on walks, going to the park, you know, playing, you know, football with masks. Kids really need the socialization time and having a discussion with them about bouncing ideas around and figure out what other kids and other parents are, are, you know, finding for opportunities for their kids to socialize. You know, it's, it's, it's happening and um, it's a must. As Dan said, these kids, their job is to be social. They develop during this, all their social emotional skills during this period is done through socialization with their peers. They're learning how to negotiate. They're learning how to um, have conversation. They're learning how to um, resolve conflicts. If we remove all of that, we, we're really um, taking away our kids' opportunity to develop, to develop these skills during this time. So um, get creative. Like Dan said, get them outside. That's the safest thing. But you know, we also have on the flip side, a lot of families have been 
um, doing the bubble thing or the pod thing where they've picked one or two kids and have kind of just allowed ongoing socialization with one or two kids where you can kind of see what those families are doing, what the risk is and kind of um, figure out exactly what level of risk you're putting your child at or, or um, you know, based on that family situation. So um, at the more time the kids can be with their friends, the better. It's, it's the, it's the um, remedy for everything that's going on here or a lot of what's going on with the pandemic. That is uh, very good to hear. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's hard to know what's the right thing to do in this situation. I, I think, you know, a lot of the questions that we saw come in as people were registering were related to, a, they're very worried about um, their kids just not coming out of their room, like choosing to be isolated. And I've seen that in my own house, like as the year wears on, it feels like the will to do those things like, oh, go play basketball with masks on or those kinds of things have just diminished as kids, you know, they like just don't want to do it anymore, um, you know, or go, I don't know, for a walk with one friend with a mask on. I think, you know, um, it, it, we've all seen that more and more. Our kids are like in their dark room with their phone or with a screen under the covers and just not coming out for hours and hours. And that um, is scary. I think it's scary. Like there's, people are worried about like, what is this doing to their development? This is a year of, of um, you know, hiding away. And then also just like on a day-to-day -day basis, is my kid okay? They're doing that, you know, they're, they're hiding away. Like what's happening and how do we help them? Um, so, so, so all right, let's like really look at that though. Okay. So, um, there's, there's a number of things like to unpack what you just said, there's a lot entrenched in that. So number one, I would say that the biggest thing in that, that I hear is, is parental concern. And, and as a parent myself, like when COVID hit, it was what if, what if, what if, what if, right. But if we follow that, what if path our kids, we would keep in a bubble and we would never let out of the house because what if, right? It's terrifying being a parent. It's a terrifying job. Um, you know, Dr. Orr is here and he knows that I've come to him with the most absurd questions about, yeah, but what if Kaya ate a plum and something bad happened, right? But the reality is that kids, look at what is. Our kids are off the charts resilient. Our kids, we told them, in March that they were gonna be out of school for two weeks. Then we told them, actually, it's gonna be like eight weeks. Actually, you're not coming back. Actually, when you come back, you're either gonna be fully remote or you're gonna be in this hybrid and you have to sit six feet apart from each other and you have to wear a mask. And they have rolled with all of that. Our kids are off the charts amazing. They, I'm not actually worried about them because they're demonstrating that they can meet reality where it's at and they find ways to be with each other. I think I, as a parent myself, I struggle with this, which is how do we mitigate our, this isn't the way the world was in 1980. This isn't the world, the world that was in 1990 or 1970 or whenever your time was. But the kids are finding ways to be kids in this world. What we need to do, I think, is find out how we can mitigate our what ifs with science, look at the facts, look at the risks. And nobody ever wants to say, you know, um, there's a one in a hundred percent chance if my kid goes outside, they're going to get hit by a car. You know, so there's 99 percent chance they're fine. But as parents, we say, yeah, but that one percent, not my kid. Right. We have to work with our own anxiety mitigate that and settle that down to say, what do the kids actually need? Are we talking to them? Are we asking them, what are you worried about? What concerns you? And instead of um, focusing on the, oh, you know, like we can validate their fears and say, yeah, that's reasonable. But how likely is that? How about we flip it and say, you know, you have been in a lockdown for since last March. 
And I notice you still have friends. I notice you still find ways to connect. I notice you still do all these great things. How do we empower that and, and um, thicken that kind of part of their life? So rather than thicken the, yeah, that is scary. We should be scared of that. How do we flip the conversation to say, here are the things that you're doing is successful and, and highlight that resiliency. You know, um, I can say at O'Mealy right now, like we're faced with the, the real issue that all of us are facing now. And I just came from a staff meeting that Becky was at where I was all up in arms because we're being asked to now go take a perfect model of hybrid learning that we've been doing all year and arbitrarily because the state wants us to flip it now we have to go full-time in person that's going to be really hard and it's going to shake up our whole world but the kids are able to meet that challenge as long as as adults we say hey this is a real challenge these are the reasons why it's a challenge and here's why you have the capacity to be successful mitigating this you guys have done everything this year that none of us adults could handle and we've been worried and you have risen to the challenge so that's the message we need to keep reinforcing with the kids is that yeah it's hard yeah you know what i'm going to use adult language this sucks this sucks this is horrible this is not fair and yet you guys have the ability to rise to this challenge look at all the skills you have to get through this and if we can keep fostering that We'll be looking back at 2020, 2021 at our kids and saying, you know, that's when you rose up. That's when you got the, you know, athlete of the year award. That's when you succeeded because we can build on their strengths instead of fixating on the what ifs. Um, I mean, that's my two cents worth. <laughs> Take it away, <laughs> Becky. <laughs> so, you know, and I, and I think Dan is right. There's so many things that, um, our kids are doing that are showing us every day how resilient they are. And um, we just did a um, an advisory lesson last week on reflecting on the last year. And some of the eighth graders were being interviewed um, in front of the entire school. And some of the things that they were saying is that coming out of this, their families are far more connected and they've spent much more time with both parents because they're not commuting, they're not working out of the home. And those are some of the things that they might miss moving forward. However, I also hear you, Aria, that, you know, I have my own teens and um, talk to a lot of parents of teens and what is very um, sad for us and frustrating and um, can be consuming is worrying about our kids and their mental health and trying to check in every day to see how they're faring. Um, I went for physical last week. My doctor has a teen son and she said he's suffering from depression right now. I'm a mental health professional and I could say at many times during these months, one of my kids has been suffering with this, with the isolation, with feeling a loss of connection to um, their old life, not really having the community um, interaction, you know, missing school, missing their friends, all of that. Um, another mental health professional I was talking to today, teenage daughter is also suffering from serious anxiety. So we're seeing things like what we're talking about with, you know, low grade, long term depression. Um, it comes from, you know, what our kids have experienced is truly a trauma, but it wasn't one major event. It was kind of like a slow burn kind of trauma. And so our kids are slowly developing um, what I've seen is more, you know, what we would see as kind of a low grade dysthymic kind of depression, like you're describing, Aria, the not coming out of the, the room. Also seeing, like I was saying, a lot of anxiety. We're seeing kids who are um, afraid to leave the house more so because they're just so in the groove of not leaving the house. So it's becoming harder to do the things, like you said, play the pickup game for of basketball, go see a friend. It gets harder to motivate to do those things out of likely, you know, low mood and the anxiety. So I think, you know, I want to validate for parents that 
even typically developing kids that pre-pandemic did not have um, this any issues, they're, they're struggling. Um, some kids struggling more than others. And some kids, it's kind of like, um, you know, every day is a different day. So what I would say is for that, watch your child very closely. And when, you know, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not in our wheelhouse to always ask for help, especially those of us who are in the field, but sometimes you need to ask for help for your kid and figure out, get a third party in to come to, to kind of figure out the level of the depression, level of the anxiety, and then help the whole family strategize around that. Um, I also feel like, you know, our kids, they need, they need every day to look at it as an isolated day. We wanna make sure our kids, you know, especially our anxious kids, they get to the gloom and doom thinking. They um, they think about what if, what if, what if, like Dan was talking about, but they also are thinking about events way in the future. Really the tip is to help our kids focus on just the day or a couple days and then come up with a plan. Those kids that are hard to motivate to get out, I would urge them, you know, you have to pick one thing. It, whether it's, you know, you're going grocery shopping with me, or you're going to take a walk with the dog and we're gonna invite a friend, pick a friend. I would actually be a little bit more instru instructive and a little bit more um, firm about getting the kids outside of their room. I do think our kids are spending way more time in their rooms on technology than we ever did. We were in our rooms as teens, but now it's like they are socializing. Um, in their rooms with their technology. However, I think we also need to urge them and be firm about getting them out of their room and kind of finding a balance. So there is the in-person interaction and the, the, the socializing on the social media. But I do think, you know, a couple things, watch it. If, if, if the staying in the room, refusing to come out and refusing to do things that brought joy or that they were motivated to do beforehand. If that goes on for a longer period of time, that's where you need to talk to your doctor. You need to go ask for help. Start with the pediatrician um, and talk it out and see what the options are and then figure out count counseling or, or other options for treatment. But I do think we need to get our kids out of their bedrooms and kind of push them in a nice, um, supported way to get out of the house and to interact with people and to do things um, that they may enjoy without even realizing that they're going to enjoy it. So you might get 10 no's before you get one yes, but keep asking. Teenagers are like that. Be persistent. We'll have fun. <laughs> um, no, I, that's such a good... Um... That's empowering to hear because I think it's confusing. Also, the, the fact that they are socializing on their technology, right? Which we've been like, ah, oh, so I guess it's okay because at least they can connect. But, you know, it's like knowing that enough is enough and like, yes, out of the room is really important. That's, that's a good reminder. Well, Aria, I'd like to actually follow up on that because I think it's an important discussion to have is that, um, you know, we see everything right now through the COVID lens, but Becky can tell you that she and I have been talking for years preceding this about, you know, the technology addiction, um, the international diagnostic code. So for like therapists, how we diagnose people, uh, the U.S. hasn't gotten there, but internationally, like technology addiction is now an actual identified mental health um, disability on the international level. And um I, despite the pandemic, we still need to put controls over that. We still need to say, you know what, buddy, it's 10 o'clock, hand over the phone, give me your power cords for your computer because it's bedtime now. And those routines of sleep and natural exposure to sleep and natural waking up times, good diet, all those things don't go out the door because of the pandemic. So it is critical that our kids socialize through social media and through all their 
various technologies. I mean, I have a record player behind me, so I'm not very hip to this, but uh, let's just say like modern kids can do what we're doing now and have a conversation. Um, but that still needs like, you know, you can go play with your friends, but you know, when I was a kid, like growing up in New Hampshire, yeah, you literally left the house when the sun came up, you came home from lunch and you went back outside and you came back when the sun set, but you still came home and socializing was over. And it's time now for family time, eating and getting ready for bed. So those routines about non-socializing are still important. So I, I, I guess I just want to reinforce that, yes, we need to socialize, we need to connect and normal bedtime routines need to happen. You should not be socializing with your friends at 2 a.m. And I see far too much of that with my kids who are like, look what Billy said it to me last night, it was so unfair. And I look and I say, 2 a.m., you guys are talking? That's ridiculous, go to bed. That would be more functional. So um, we need to find that balance between the, the technological socializing and normal bedtime. You know, It's okay to, as parents, set those boundaries. And I encourage you to meet with other parents and all of you set the same boundaries so that when your kid says, yeah, but you know, Aria's mom lets her talk. No, she doesn't actually, because we're friends and we all agreed 10 is the cutoff point. Suck it up, you know. <laughs> good points, all good points. Um, I think that, um, well, I don't know if you'll have an answer to this, but I'm, I think that sometimes people like to know like, okay, how much is too much? What do you have a rule of thumb? Like is, what do you tell parents when they're like, I don't know how to stop it or, you know, what, how many hours is okay? Do you have a guidelines that you like to give? So that's interesting because the American Academy of Pediatrics has always said two hours of screen time is the max that you know our kids should be experiencing throughout the day and that anything more than that could potentially be um, you know not a healthy thing. So I think you know we've talked about there's there's different types of screen time and actually different types of screen time impact the brain in different ways. So um, I would say it is playing a video game that's really high stimulus is very different than looking at, you know, your Google Docs and, and working on, on a, a term paper. So I would say, you know, I would feel like right now, all of the kids in this pandemic are getting far more screen time than has ever been recommended by doctors. Did, did Dr. Orr just chime in? Um, I think he just wrote something in the chat regarding that. So, but you know, here's the thing, what we need to do is our kids are on the screen way more than is likely recommended right now. And is there's really nothing we can, you know, do to change that right now, given that school is mostly screen-based, but we have to balance that with putting the screens away, getting outside. I've talked about um, the power of vitamin nature and, you know, being outside in the green can undo that impact of the, the blue light and the flashing lights on the screen. Um, we need to make sure our kids are, are I know they want to socialize on the computer or play Fortnite or whatever they're doing in order to socialize with their friends, but we have to make sure that they're also putting it away and doing other things that aren't screen-based. I think what, what Dan was talking about with the technology addiction, I really fear that coming out of it, we're going to have to retrain a lot of kids and um, get them you know, weaned off of the technology because I think that, that kids are you know, relying on that now way too often. It's a battle. As a parent, I think it's always a battle. Every day you're thinking about there my kid is on the screen again. We just have to make sure that we have, um, like Dan said, some, some parameters around it and making sure that we're having our kids engaging in other things that aren't entertainment based, you know, screen based entertainment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to jump on that and Give me a big soapbox because I could be here all day. So number one, we, we are privileged to have Ben Lemus with us. Um, so what we need to be encouraging is that while our kids are in person at school, um, we have this belief in our culture that technology is the future, right? 
and, and to many degrees it is. But given how much time our kids are spending on asynchronous and remote learning, while they're in person, we should be fully focusing on non-technology driven. It's okay to do pen and paper at school while you're in person. It's actually great. Like it, it bothers me to walk into a classroom and see a teacher quietly typing to the students and the students in front of screens while we're in person right now, just during this, this COVID thing. So I think the message we really need to, to import on our teachers and, and to the school is to say, yeah, technology is important. Our kids need that skill set to be you know, moving into 21st century learning. But during this COVID thing, they do that while they're at home 100%. So while they're in person, we need to foster more to more interaction, turn and talk to your peer, you're six feet apart, you have a mask on, the COVID spread is minimal at that rate, but that human to human interaction is what we've evolved to, to work with. We're not evolved for technology. Um, it, even Bill Gates says like, your kids should not be online until they're 15 or older. Um, I, I personally don't think any of our kids at O'Mealy should have a cell phone. I'm sorry, but you can call us at school and we'll get your kid and they'll get a ride home. But their, their prefrontal cortex isn't wired. They're not able to mitigate this technology. And uh, for Becky and I, we're great people and we use our skill set for good. But there are people in our field who have learned that, you know, when the slot machine gives out a payout at a random interval and goes ching, 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 everybody throws their quarters into the machine, right? It's an addiction based thing that makes people money. And we as parents and community members are buying into that. And it's really dangerous. It's way beyond COVID, but our kids' brains are being hijacked by technology. We're really, you know, if you go back, I mean, there was books on nature deficit disorder coming out way before COVID. And our kids have a deficit of interaction with the natural world. I mean, I know I talk to my gamer boys and I'm like, it's the big blue room. It's this, this place you go to and you breathe oxygen and you play and you run around, go try it. It's awesome, right? But the reward system of video games and people liking me, that feeds into their developmental stage. It feeds into that endorphin release for them to say like, well, 400 people I don't know liked this post and like this dress I'm wearing, so I have value, but it, it's inauthentic and it doesn't really sustain kids or foster that internal motivation to be, this is what I'm passionate about in my life. This is what's important. So technology is, is a great tool. Um, I, I, I feel like a poor person to be expressing this because I think Becky's laughing now. I've never sent a text. It's I've never done it. I know it's weird, but um, and yet <laughs> here I am doing a Zoom talk, right? Um, yeah. But our kids need to engage in real human life. That's what we're designed for. And when we don't do the things that humans are meant to do, we suffer. So I would say that that endorphin kick when I, I want to say Facebook and then every middle school I work with laughs and it's like only my parents are on Facebook, right? But every like Snapchat, every post a kid posts and they get a like kicks off that endorphin. To me, that's no different than when a kid goes out and vapes and they get an endorphin rush and it fuels them. Yeah, it, it, gives them that hit that makes them feel special, but it's inauthentic and it's not healthy. Healthy relationships are what we should be fostering. And that's person to person, interpersonal, real meaningful connection, not, you know, the fake sense of myself I put online. And I hope you all like this pretend version of me that I created, but it's not authentic. So, um, yeah, technology is awesome and it does a lot of great things. And during this COVID crisis, we could not have been so successful academically without it. But since we're using it for academics, we don't need to use it during non-academic time. You know what, kid? Shut off your phone. We're going to sit as a family and this is going to drive you nuts and you're going to hate me, but we're going to do a puzzle tonight and we're going to make dinner together and we're going to listen to like something on the radio or CD, you know, we'll go really old school for the kids, but uh, we're going to do this as a family and we're going to interact in a real meaningful way. And the kids will be all annoyed until they're doing it. And then they'll be like, Hey, this is actually kind of cool. I like this. 
Well, important, important things to keep in mind. I, I want to shift gears a little bit and um, because a lot of people have asked questions about um, anxiety and um, and how to help their kids. Um, like some kids are coming out of remote school and into in-person school potentially, or even the shift that's coming up, as you noted pretty soon, that the school schedule is going to change. Um, I think that can raise some some fear and some anxiety and there's transition ahead. I, th I think even looking a little further down the road, like helping our kids come out of this whole year of strangeness and re-entering society, which we will at some point, um, it's it's a little daunting. And what what is there damage that's been done that we need to like, you know, fix? Is there, how can we like help them through that process? Um, Rebecca, do you have something to? Yeah, I think the good news is that kids are so resilient. And I think where some kids will have a little bit more of a struggle coming out of this and going back to more like a normal routine, whether it be full-time school, you know, all of the activities and all of that, um, some kids will struggle, some kids will do it seamlessly. That's just the way it is for everything. But I think, you know, that anxiety and what, you know, that is going to be experienced. And I think one of the things parents need to understand is that the better we can manage our own anxiety about being, you know, re doing the re-entry into the world and going back to school, the better we can manage that for ourselves, the better it will be for our child. We have to be very careful about not putting our own anxieties into our kids' heads. And I feel like, you know, we can think about, oh my goodness, we're going back to a full-time schedule. What is that gonna mean? Um, how many kids are gonna be in the class? We're going to have a lot of fears, totally natural, a lot of um, concerns. What I would say is try not to express those fears in front of your child. Um, if you have questions, ask the school, ask other parents, find out information to kind of quell your own anxiety. And then talk to your kid about how they're feeling about it. We don't want to insert our anxieties onto them, but they might also have some anxieties about some things that we're not even thinking about. It could be more about, you know, what, you know, how am I going to get to school? Things that are minor, that are easily fixed that we haven't even thought of. So, you know, managing our own anxiety and, you know, taking into account that parents have a lot of power all over the like the emotional ecosystem of, of a family. So the more we can do, you know, anxiety management on ourselves, the better it will be for our kids. But also I do think there's gonna be a lot of anxious kids. I think separation anxiety, separation from parents might be, um, be seen more um, prominently than, than before. We might have some kids that are a little bit reluctant to go to school because of that. Um, but I think we need to not put our own anxieties on the kids, but talk to the kids about what exactly they're worried about. Contact the school. Figure out a way, if you find that, if you're, if you're worried that your child is going to be one of those kids that's going to have a, a harder time making that transition back to school, contact the school and come up with a plan. I always say, you know, when you're anxious about something, the treatment is to not avoid it. It's to experience it slowly and, um, you know, step by step in a way that supported and managed. And if your kid needs to go visit the school, go walk around when nobody's there, um, meet a teacher or two in person, um, you know, do all of that. I think, you know, our kids that are coming out of remote might potentially need a little bit more support in that reintegration into, into full-time school than our other kids. But some kids are just temperamentally a little bit more anxious than others. So, you know, you just need to meet your child where they're at. But, but like I said, be very careful about taking our own life experiences and our own anxieties and, and inserting them into our kids' heads. Um, they, they will come up with their own things that they're worried about, but I think we need to problem solve around those and not, you know, give them other things to worry about as well. 
That is a good reminder. Um, I think I'm sure we all do that. Um, and just a quick note, if anyone wants to ask a question before our time is up, I really encourage you to just stick your hand up. It can be anything. It can be very specific related to your own child or something general. This is a great opportunity to just put it out there because we can all learn from what, what each other are going through. I think we all have really shared experiences here. Um, Dan, did you have anything to add to that about um, how to help our yeah, kids? I think, um... I have a million things to add. <laughs> so, uh, so number one, like uh, just for parents who are sending kids back to school for the first time, um, my experience with every student I've had return to school is that uh, the night before they have like high level anxiety. What if, what if, what if I'm worried about this? Oh my gosh, what's it going to be like? School's different. About five minutes in the building, I see this literal like pressure come off and just the relaxation to, oh my gosh, I'm back to normal. I'm back in school. Somebody just told me to stand in line and raise my hand or not, you know, oh, use a school voice, whatever. That mitigates a lot of that anxiety. When they come in and the fears they have returning are valid. They haven't been there in a while. But I go back to like when my, like when my daughter started preschool, the first day it was, Oh, I'm going to school and Papa and Nomi, I worry about you. And like when Miss Marnie came out of the preschool and grabbed Kaya, she was gone. And I was like, wait, we love you. Can we take a picture? No, nope, she's off. She's gone. She's fine. Right. They, when they finally get there, they're going to be okay. Um, but what I also suggest is like, let's talk about anxiety because we, Culturally, we, we live in an age of anxiety. We have a lot of things we're concerned about. We have geopolitical stuff. We have pandemics. We, there's a lot we're anxious about, but what is anxiety? I, I think we fall into the trap with all emotions where we start putting these um, value judgments on it, like anxiety, bad, happy, good, but that's inaccurate, right? Anxiety is a great thing. Anxiety is a, a great skill to foster. So if, um, if I have a big test tomorrow, if I'm going for my licensing exam and I don't have anxiety, am I going to study? Nope. I feel confident. But if I don't study, how well am I going to do? Anxiety, when I walk into a sketchy neighborhood, makes me a little more attentive to what's going on around me, right? So anxiety is not good or bad. Anxiety is an a evolutionarily designed tool that serves us well. The challenge is when the anxiety is, doesn't match the situation, right? When the anxiety gets too high and you're going to school, like that's literally the safest place for kids. If you look at, I mean, this is data driven, right? The children are safer at school than at your home. And I know that's shocking, but it's actually, it's scientific fact. It's, they're better off there than at home. Um, so what do we do with that anxiety is how do we, how do we use it as a tool and not let it be something that consumes us? And the way we let it uh, be a functional tool is we have a conversation about it. Okay, what are you nervous about? Yep, those are valid reasons. Um, you're gonna be around other people you haven't been around. Social situations are kind of awkward, especially in middle school and high school. That's like the definition of middle school and high school, right? It's awkward, but that's okay. What skills do you have to manage that? What have you done previously where you've been successful? Yeah, I know you're a little worried about that. Remember your first day at, at elementary school? Remember how nervous you were? Remember that first day? I, I've been talking this with my eighth graders about, um, I have this awesome girl who uh, suffers from severe anxiety to the point where her, she gets panic attacks and she actually has medication she has to take at the nurse's office if it's triggered. So I met her the first time in sixth grade. For those of you who were around then, um, maybe remember O'Malley had a tornado warning where we had to hide in the basement and then a lightning bolt hit our, one of our power generators and we had a little fire and we had to evacuate the building after the tornado warning. First time I met this girl with high off the charts anxiety. And now she talks about that moment every day about I was so freaked out and we did those breathing exercises and you told me, yeah, this is messed up. This is scary, but we'll be okay. We're gonna get through this. She uses that moment now in eighth grade to mitigate normal eighth grade anxiety, right? 
So we wanna talk about the kids' strengths. What have you done to get to where you are? Yes, it's scary. Yes, it's something worth being nervous about, meaning paying attention to. But what skills do you have to manage that? How do you manage your anxiety? How do you regulate yourself to say, whoa, I'm at the edge of the diving board. I have to dive off into this huge pool and I'm so scared and I know it's safe. So what's gonna get me off that diving board is knowing that I've done things in the past that tell me I'm gonna be successful moving forward. So focus on strengths, focus on ability and don't focus on the, oh, this could all go wrong, right? Acknowledge it, but focus on the strengths our kids have. Our kids are amazing. They're off the charts. Every one of you, phenomenal parent. Your kids have gone through the craziest school year ever, ever. I mean, you know, in, in my history, talking about like 9-11 is a big deal, right? I remember where I was at 9-11, right? But that was one day. These kids have sustained this for a year and they're succeeding and they're learning and they're going to school and they're making friends. And yes, there are challenges and they're more depressed and they're more isolated, but they're still successful. So what is it that's helping them be successful and how do we capitalize on that and reinforce that? That's where our focus should be. Why are you so awesome? Kid, you <laughs> went to school today when I couldn't, you're amazing. Do it again. Yeah, I like that. Focus on the on the positive, focus on the accomplishments. Um, I, we have a hand up and I just wanna make sure we get to um, Aaron Quinn, you have a question, go ahead. Hey everyone. I have less of a question and more of like a parent to parent comment almost. Um, I wanted to just say, I'm kind of the old school parent, like if my kids are dramatic or injured or whining, I just, tell them to deal with it and you know, you'll know you be fine, suck it up. That's generally my approach. And they're usually fine. Yes. <laughs> my point here is that I think the pandemic is so different and has presented our kids with this completely different um, situation and they don't necessarily know how to deal with it. And so what I wanna say to the other parents who are here is that if your kid says to you that they're really struggling, believe them. Mm -hmm. They're not being dramatic. They're not begging for attention. They're really struggling. And I think um, I've got an eighth grader and a kind of an old fifth grader. <laughs> so he's like more of a sixth grader. And the combination of the pandemic and the hormones and the isolation and everything really adds up for them. And I think that I learned very quickly that many of the things that I would normally in regular life dismiss as a little bit of drama, a little bit of attention seeking behavior is actually them saying, for the love of Christ, mom, I need some help. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that is to say that Dan and Becky are an astoundingly effective team. And although I don't have any kids in the high school yet, I will say that to be able to reach out to Becky and to to say like, this is what's happening with my kid. And this is how you can help. My daughter says to me without hesitation that Becky is like one of the biggest supports oh. that she has. Oh. This is over and above like her regular therapist that she's had for years. Like the team that we have in place is so good and so effective and really just astounding from a parent's point of view. So I think feeling comfortable taking advantage of this team of professionals that are right here to help our kids in a way that we really can't, right? Like your kid's different at school than they are at home and you have to recognize that. And there are things that they would say to Becky or Dan that they wouldn't say to us at home. And so giving them that opportunity to connect with a different adult in a different setting and really be open is just such a great opportunity for them and therefore for you and your family. So don't hesitate. Oh, Erin, the love, I can't even, I can't oh even, God. thank you so much. And you know, it's, it's parents who can keep an open line of communication with their kids um, that have done better in this pandemic. And Erin, you said it right. When your kid comes to you and says, 
Mom, why am I so sad all the time? I can't stop feeling sad. You need to do something about it. And, um, you know, the more, I know it's really hard to, to access outside services right now, but the more you can keep that open communication and checking in constantly with your teens during this time, the more you can do that, the better. They're, the one thing they need to learn is that feelings aren't forever. There are things that we can do that can change no matter how dark we're feeling one day, there are things and supports we can put in place so that you don't feel this way forever. Feelings, the best thing about them is that they change and they, they become less intense and they're not always the same day to day. But, um, you know, I think, you know, if I had to say a parting thing is even if your child is reluctant to communicate with you, keep checking in to see how they're doing, especially if you have that kid that's having a hard time coming out of the room or, um, not being motivated to do the things that you feel like they, they would typically enjoy, you know, keep talking to them and checking in. But thank you, Erin, you're amazing. Hey, um, Becky, I just wanna ask you a question about um, uh, those kids who are communicating, but perhaps in ways that uh, I know when my kids were younger um, and they've gotten over most of this, they communicate in ways that I don't, didn't always appreciate, but they were communicating. You know, um, it could have been a grunt, could have been a moan, could have been a yell, could have been all sorts of things, you know, but they were still communicating. So can you talk to us about, you know, like you said, keep those lines of communication open and how do you do that even when they're giving you every indicator, you know, verbally and otherwise, loud or otherwise, um, of cut it out, don't communicate, we leave me alone. How, how do parents keep checking in, keep connecting, keep at it? Yeah. And I think we, you know, teenagers are tricky because what they say, what they're saying, they often choose a very interesting manner of, so how they say things is not as important as what they're saying. So, you know, you may have the kid that's groaning, swearing, kicking. These are all how they are communicating what you need to do is figure out what's the message underneath. I would say be persistent. I mean, you know, the more you attempt conversations and not take the surliness, anger, all of that personally, the better. What you need to do is try to glean the underlying message and say, acknowledge, I I see that you're angry. I see that you're frustrated. I see that you're X, Y, and Z. I'm guessing that it might be because of this. Will you tell me about that? Explain that to me. Use open-ended questions um, and don't give up. Don't give up. Kids have a knack and especially teenagers have a knack of trying to push parents away. And what we often see is um, an angry response, but we're, what's really underlying that is typically an insecurity, an anxiety, um, you know, a worry, um, something that's a little bit more vulnerable rather than the, the presentation. So um, yeah, I would say don't take it personally and don't give up. Yeah, I think the, the takeaway there is, um, <laughs> sorry, my answering machine's going off. <laughs> Let me deal with it. What about door slamming? Is that communicating? <laughs> Definitely. I just shut off my in-laws, so we all got our challenges. <laughs> no, I think the thing to remember is that teenagers, especially like the early teens, like when the hormones are just kicking in, go back to two. Do you remember your two-year-old who was, no, I can do this. I'm fine. Hug me, I'm sad like we get over that phase with our kids and then they start being like people we can communicate with. And then those teenage years kick in and the teenage years are a regression to that. I'm super independent. You're the person, my job is to like be independent from you and I totally need you. So we often take it personally with teenagers, like Becky was saying, and it has nothing to do with us. Like a kid's ego is like this, right? So if we meet our ego with their ego, it's a losing battle. The reality is that 
if you can be a little self-deprecating and use, I, I love Aaron, what you said about like the resources, especially at our middle school, there is no middle school I know of. And I used to do outpatient therapy in middle schools from like Revere, Lynn, all the way up the North shore. O'Malley is off the charts. We have three guidance counselors. You have me, you have Shelly Lazat, you have Becky. We have a, a student assistance counselor. We have more mental health services than you could handle. And it's almost impossible to get mental health services right now. Everybody's escalated. Call us and, and tell your kid, you know what? Fine, you won't talk to me. And then I can talk to the kid and be like, yeah, your parents are nuts. Let's talk. And I'll say the exact same thing you're telling them. They'll think I'm a genius. They'll think you're insane. And we're saying the exact same thing. But their job is not to listen to you because they're trying to be independent of you. So validate that. Just be like, you know what? Maybe I don't have all the answers. Why don't you talk to somebody else? It's, it's challenging because we know we're right and we actually are. But um, our kids aren't going to hear that. So allow them, have a conversation with us. We'll get the same message through to your kids and they'll respond to us and it's no not by any fault of yours when my daughter comes to amelie she's going to think i'm the stupidest person in the world and i don't know anything and all the other middle schoolers that see me will be like oh mr graham understands my parents don't right because that's how teenagers work um but use those resources that are available to you uh becky and i answer questions all the time we're happy to help you we're totally invested in our community and just reach out. You have great, we have awesome pediatricians. I mean, we got Dr. Orr here tonight, right? That's a, that's a testament to what you have for resources in your community. Um, we know how to access outside services. I come from the mental health world, not the school world. So we can, we can guide you in all this. Just reach out and have a conversation with us and don't get in that power struggle with the kids just smile and say, you know what? I am totally inept, kid. You're right. I don't know anything. I don't even know how you walk or are capable of eating, but I know other people who can help. And pass the buck. Don't take it personal. And they're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. We've gotten through this and we're going to continue to be successful. Your kids are actually okay. Um, but when you need us, we're here to, to validate that for you. I think we could probably do a whole night on just how to communicate with teenagers. So put that on the docket for another right. time. Right. We could have done that in 2019, right? <laughs> uh, we have one last question in the chat that I want to try to get to. I know we're running a little late, but if you guys are willing to hang around a couple more minutes. Um, this is from Jen. Um, she's asking about, she's saying there's, there's a lot of discussion about people being home more. But what about the kids uh, from of essential workers who've been, these kids have been navigating the logistics of hybrid schooling on their own. It's very complicated as we all know. And she, she said, my sense is that they're very tired. I'm curious if this comes up, if you guys hear about this in your work, what are you hearing? How can we better support those kids who are just kind of tapped out? Yeah, I think I think we're seeing a lot of kids. I absolutely know of many, many kids who go home after our half day and um, do, you know, six or eight hours of time at home alone before a parent comes home. And that is extremely isolating. Um, you know, overall, I think a lot of our kids are having some motivational struggles, um, even when there is a parent at home with getting back on the screen and doing, you know, whatever their asyn asynchronous work, um, whatever's been um, um, given to them for the day. Um, I think having a realistic idea of what our kids are actually capable of doing independently is very important. I think what we've asked them to do overall, whether you have a parent home or not, um, is well beyond this developmental age. And we're asking them to do things that even our college um, level kids don't necessarily have the brain capacity for. 
the kids that are doing the best during this, you know, hybrid model are the ones that have like freakishly developed frontal lobes for their age. <laughs> and they have that internal motivation and they know how to be organized and they can keep track of everything and they self advocate when they need help, you know, all of that. So I think, you know, we need to kind of really examine that and be a little less hard on our kids because this is a very impossible task for some of them. So specifically to those kids that are home alone, what we've been able to do is we do have some kids that are able to stay after school for longer periods of time. So contact the school about figuring out, you know, how we can get, you know, that student to do some of that remote work in school so that they're not alone, not necessarily because they need help, but that they need, you know, contact with, with human beings. Um, so there's that piece. There's other kids that, um, you know, depending on parents' comfort level are, they're, they're doing their hybrid work or their remote work at, um, together after school in, um, you know, what, even whether they're working on different things, but just being with another person has been really, really helpful with the motivation factor. So, you know, that, that being alone for long periods of time, absolutely hearing that. So, um, you know, whereas many parents have the luxury of being home and, you know, whether or not, you know, it's, they're being helpful with their kid, you know, it's nice to have that parent home, um, but there are a lot of kids who are in the community alone for many hours a day doing their schoolwork. I know the Y has a program where kids can go do schoolwork after school as well. Um, so there, there's another option there, but there are some resources. I think it's very important to make sure those kids, if they're really struggling to figure out how to, how to get them some support so they're not just sitting at home alone struggling. Yeah, I would say for those kids, like April 28th is a game changer because we're back full time. But even after school stuff, um, I can speak for Amelie. We have the after school clubs. Get the kids engaged in anything you can. You know, my daughter has a, a weird dance class she goes to every week. I don't understand it because it's like martial arts and dancing, but she loves it and she's engaging with her peers. Um, Anything you can get the kids doing where they're engaged with their peers is a positive. Uh, but I think, you know, aside from all this, I think I'd like to ask us to do just a quick exercise if people are up for this, because I'm a shrink and I like to do things. Uh, could everybody just like sit up straight for a minute? Yeah, you know, take a deep breath and put your hand in the air. Whoop. Just one, reach it back, touch your back if you can. Give yourself a little pat and say, good job. <laughs> I have raised a child or children during a global pandemic that we have not seen in a hundred years. I have got my kids through every day. They're still here. Um, they're fed, they're thriving, they're okay. And I did that. And I, I, I'd say that I, it seems kind of silly what I'm asking you to do right now, but I mean it genuinely. Good job. All that anxiety, all that fear. Good job look what you've done look what you've gotten them to during this impossible time and we are trending back towards normal but it's okay you're doing a good job there's no handbook for global pandemic let's be honest if you were to raise if i would ask people to raise their hands now the first three days you had your child coming back from the hospital who thought they wouldn't make it right <laughs> Who, thought, who didn't sleep because every 30 seconds you were checking to see if they were breathing. They're okay. Kids are insanely resilient. They're designed to survive our ineptitude because we don't know what we're doing and they can survive that. But you've done it. You have succeeded. So if you can own your awesome for being great parents, and I genuinely mean that, you're here now. You're great parents. Own your awesome and know that all that fear and anxiety and worry about what if, what if, what if, they're here now. They got through this and they wouldn't have been able to do it without you. Becky and I are, you know, I'm not shameful. Like we're the most amazing people you could ever have work with your kids. <laughs> Becky more so, cause I go to, I consult with her every day to make sure I'm not a fool, but you got them in the building. You got them up. 
you got them engaged, you got them to do their homework. That's you, that's not us. So as long as you can just take that moment to say, ah, oh, put the panic aside, you know what? This was an insane, ridiculous year. And yet I got my kid through this. So that when your grandchildren come along and those same kids are whining to you about like, eh, they won't sleep, they won't eat. You can be like, I raised you during a global pandemic, get a grip, right? That's your power now. You have that over your children. Own your power, right? About, own your awesome. You guys, everybody here deserves like a virtual high five. You nailed it. You got your kids through this. Thanks. And at the end of the day, they're gonna be okay. Thanks, Dan. Um, we do have one more question. I'm not sure if it's something we can answer tonight, but it was a question about going back to school and school lunch and how that's gonna go. I um, They'll be fed, it'll be fine. <laughs> There will be lunch. There will be food. <laughs> it will be in the cafeteria and kids will be together, but there will be some guidelines around it. So it's for you because the hybrid, like, you know, hybrid model has worked perfectly. We mm -hmm. could feed them nutritional lunches at home. And now they're going back to school full time. Oh, no. Yeah. So mo moms and dads will have to make lunches in the morning again. It will happen. That was one of those silver lining things that, I personally enjoyed not having to deal with, um, but kids will be in the lunchroom. So I don't know what, what your fear is, but there will be lunch served. Um, kids will go out to recess. There will be some sort of modification around it from what we're understanding, you know, that the, you know, the details are being ironed out as we speak, but um, there will be, you know, the social distancing and all of that. Yeah. Ben has all the answers. He can tell us everything. No, so no, Ben, no, resolve no. all our concerns. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't have all the answers because we, as you know, we are still creating the answers. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I just, just uh, uh, Becky's right. Lunch will be served in the cafeteria, but it won't be just. You know, we will still be giving folks bagged lunches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Breakfast will always be also be there as bagged. Okay. I will say this that, you know. Um, this, this, and we'll be communicating and, and get more outreach in the next couple of days to give folks updated where we are, you know, a mailing on this switch is until April 28th. Okay. The week of April 26th. So we're still a fairly long way away, but there is still a ton of work on that. The two biggest challenges are, um, are really, you know, figuring out lunch and distancing there, um, and doing it quickly in terms of serving lunch quickly, eating quickly, getting kids out to recess. And then the other challenge is, um, you know, more folks want to want to come back to school, which is great. It's where we want them, um, but we do have to figure out um, what happens if a class is bigger than what can be fit into a room at three feet distance. And we'll have that challenge with that at middle and high school. Um, we can cap things a little bit better at the elementary school, but but that's those are two of the biggest challenges. But we'll be sharing with you through email and through the school committee um, uh, uh, more updates as we go. But um, things are a work in progress. Um, one thing uh, we are have to nail down start and end times and trying to change those as little as possible. But please know that some schools will have to change start times uh, because of bus transportation. Uh, when you get to a full day uh, with our current start times, you converge the elementary and middle school pickup, uh, you know, dismissal times, and we can't have five schools, including O'Malley, all at the same dismissal time. So we are working through and we'll be communicating with folks about, uh, do we change elementary uh, beginning times or do we uh, change O'Malley start time? So uh, more on that later. Um, but it's, 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 those are some of the challenges we're facing uh, and they're not insignificant. But despite those challenges, I mean, let's be honest, that we are dealing with this information in real time, just like the rest of you are, but I have full confidence and I can say both as an employee of Gloucester Public Schools and as a parent of a Gloucester Public School student, um, Ben has been awesome at communicating with us and working with everybody and collaborating. There's no secrets here. Everything's open and this will be, as this process unfolds, Parents, you'll be involved, staff are involved, like it, there's nothing happening behind closed doors. It's a very open process. And you know, as we know what the answers are, 
they go right out to you as parents. So just keep an eye on your emails and um, know that those questions will be answered. And if they're not, just reach out to the schools because we're here to work with you. We're not like hiding behind the scenes doing stuff. We're, we're here to partner with you and collaborate with our community. And, um, you know, that's, that's, it's Gloucester. It's an island, you know, <laughs> we, we play the island. Some people come from across the bridge, but, you know, we forgive them for that. <laughs> yeah, I'll just I'll just say that last piece on this, which is uh, Dan's right. If 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 uh, we we if you're not getting information answers from us, it's because we haven't we don't have them yet. We're we're in, in the process. Okay, so please realize as we've been going all year, we are running as fast as we can, and this is this has been a big curveball. But also, I agree with Dan that one thing I've learned in being here for a short time is, man, Gloucester folks get things done, and uh, it's one of the best things about being here is. Uh, I work with so many people who are solution finders as opposed, as opposed to just problem identifiers. And, and that is a joy, a real joy for me. So all right, I'll hand it back to you if you want to wrap it up. Oh, Aria, you, you're muted. Gosh, my bad, sorry. Um, there's one question. Um, I, I just wanna, before we get there, I know we're running way over the time that we said we were gonna do. So if people need to log off, totally fine. Thank you so much for being here. It's been awesome to hear, um, you know, what's on your mind as parents and to hear from our experts. Um, and I also just wanted everyone to know in the chat, we are also starting another series of workshops um, that's really focused on you guys, um, knowing that like you are putting so much energy into your kids and being great parents and it is hard and exhausting and knowing that until you take care of yourself, it's really hard to take care of other people. So we're gonna do a, a With older high school students and this concern of anxiety and depression and the trauma that they're experiencing. Um, as we start to be parents looking at sending our kids to college, um, it would be nice not just how to select the college, but how do we get our kids ready um, given what they've gone through and how do you know whether to maybe take a gap year? Nobody's jumping on that. Come on, Becky. <laughs> and that doesn't need to no, be answered you know, now. I'm just saying, like, as we, no, no, as we start to get this info from no. guidance offices, if that type of info um, guidance could be offered. So I, I think there would there'd be two things. I mean, of course, we work at the middle school level. So so college prep is, is more of a far off concept for what we do for every day. But a couple of things is, you know, at that age group, kids need to know what they're ready for and what they're prepared for. So the gap year is kind of dependent on where that child is at and where you're communicating. Um, but I, I guess the, the one thing that I could say that I feel very confident about is that, you know, I'm in the university system. I take on interns every year and I'm involved with Salem State and, and what the conversations there have been about is preparing that the incoming group of kids are going to be very different than previous years. And they know that going into it. So the expert, you know, your, your child wouldn't be an independent, you know, my kid has a unique experience. This whole generation is experiences the same thing and colleges are discussing this, or right? at least Salem state is at this point. But, um, the other thing I would say is just, you know, the piece of that that maybe isn't recognized is rituals and like our culture and as human beings, like rituals to celebrate transitions and holidays and notable events have been really mucked up by this whole social isolation thing. Um, I come at this because my, my work is actually more like I do grief work and work with children who have had like parent loss and things like that. But what we found is that creating individualized rituals when the culture can do the ritual is just as powerful. So if your kids are graduating high school without the big celebration and the parties and things we typically do, find something for that 
kid that is meaningful to mark that transition and that there's a ritual that you can celebrate for that transition, that helps prepare people across all lifespans for the next developmental stage, like an acknowledgement that's meaningful intuitively to that person. Um, that helps prepare people for the next step, right? So our kids coming out of high school, if they don't have a graduation and there's no moment that kind of is a demarcation point between high school and college, that makes that transition a little awkward. But if you do something independently as a family to acknowledge that like, hey, you've, you've transitioned into this next stage, that can be powerful in preparation. Um, and then just, like I said, you know, the colleges are ready for a generation that's not quite ready for college because of the pandemic. They're going to meet your kids where they're at and, and they'll get through it and it'll be okay. Yeah, the only thing I have to add on that is, you know, this pandemic has definitely taught us that whatever our future plan was and what we expected would happen did not happen this year and just have a flexible mind that the the plan of you graduate high school then you go on to college immediately that might not be the right step for many of our kids if they're not ready so you know it, it is an individual conversation and an individual thing but i i do think that you know reaching out to to the guidance staff at the high school and and having that conversation but my my point is just be flexible for the for the possibility that the way we thought things would go in a step by step way might take a left turn yep. and that's okay and it sounds like you're thinking that way anyway Aaron, I'll just wrap up by saying I'll, I'll pass on to James Cook and and through him to the to the counselors at at the high school just about this particular interest and in, you know mm -hmm. having it up you know it's it's always more and more of a conversation about what to do. If you're headed, you know, whatever you're headed to after college, whatever your path is, like what happens, you know, it used to be sort of, you know, you know, work or college, right? Um, and now there is like something, maybe something different in there, you know, and, and so and I think it's really important for us uh, to, for our counselors to talk with parents in a way that acknowledges that, that this transition is a little bit different, you know, um, and, and to help folks be thoughtful about it, what, what's right for their family and, and, and their students. So I'll pass that on definitely to Principal Cook. So thank you. For what it's worth, like I work for Gloucester Public Schools. I have master's plus. I have more degrees than a thermometer and I didn't get my first one until 19 years after high school. I own a private practice. Like your kids will be okay. They don't have to like graduate and go right to college. There's a whole bunch of life that can happen in between and it doesn't speak doom. <laughs> like let them develop as they will. You know, there's a great, um, I, I guess I would conclude with like one of my favorite books that my wife and I read when we were raising our daughter was called the, uh, the Gardener and the Carpenter. And the idea was that a carpenter has a plan and they build to a plan and everything has to conform to the plan. But what happens when you don't have the right pieces or things aren't cut to the right shape, suddenly the plan is out of whack and you don't know what to do. A gardener tends to the soil, provides the light, the water and the resources that something needs to grow, but allows whatever is growing to flourish as it will. So my, my suggestion would be like be gardening parents, create opportunity for your kids. Don't try and conform them to a plan. Just let them grow as they will and they'll be okay. Um, things can only go wrong if you have a plan, right? If there's no plan, what can go wrong? Um, but, you know, give them what they need to thrive and they'll be okay. All right. Well, I think we've asked all our questions and, you know, feel free to reach out after this um, if you wish you asked something and didn't, and we can help you find the answers, everybody. Um, so thank you so much, Dan and Rebecca. This has been really helpful and um, interesting and lots of good insights. And thank you all the parents who joined us tonight. It's been really great to see you. Um, and I hope we get to see each other in person sometime soon. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.